heard uh, today, Lord, that uh, he sent the rain, right? Yes, praise him. Uh, it's just uh, a refreshing feel just to know that the rains came and just to stand there and watch it rain. How many of you walked in it this morning? Anybody with an umbrella? We had two inches in McBain and an, and an inch, between an inch and two inches around McNeil. Good. Sweet. Want to welcome you all here this morning, uh, especially uh, Pastor Rich. We, we, we thank him that he came. So we want to welcome you here, and we're looking forward to your blessing us with uh, some God's word. Uh, good to also see Mandy and Isabel and Aiden and Carolyn here this morning. And so uh, we want to say welcome and glad you came back to say hi. So praise God for that, too. Uh, so, uh, with that, we're going to begin our worship service, and this morning, it's our uh, call to worship is from Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have uh, brought us here together this morning. And we thank and praise you, Lord, for the rain that you have sent to us. We thank you for blessing us, for loving us. You care for us. And you supply our needs. Sometimes not in our timing, but it is always in your good time and your good pleasure. Father, we praise you. We praise you for loving us and sending Jesus for us. And it's in him we come to worship and to praise in song and in message. May it touch our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our first song is going to be Be Thou Are My Vision, um, 859. Of course, it's on the screen.
you know, sometimes if things go wrong, they're going to go wrong, and I gave Mike the sheet that I need. Okay. <laughs> you, did you take it with you or not? Is it, you got it here? Yes. Okay, I gave you, see there's two sheets to the, to the service, yes. and he's got the two for next week, and I gave him the, I, yeah, I gave you the, the one I'm supposed to have. Part of the first week, July 19, I think. And you see what happens when you get a little old? Oh, man. Surely must have messed this up. <laughs> anyway, I had it all straight. Did I read your 26? I don't know where it went. I'm confused. Oh, it's on the back side. Okay, I'm sweating now, folks. Well, anyway, it doesn't have to be perfect, does it? So, it just has to be in praise to the Lord. So, thank you for putting up with this. Um, we're going to pray a prayer of confession together uh, as we come before the Lord and um, it's a confession of idolatry and it's going to be up on the screen I'm assuming so here we go yeah I'll read the first and then you read the dark <coughs> almighty and loving God we confess that we put our trust in other gods we honor these gods alongside of you and in place of you. By the Holy Spirit's power, help us to know the only true God as you have revealed yourself in your word. To trust in you alone, to look to you for every good thing, humbly and patiently, and to love, fear, and honor you with all our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. We also have uh, an assurance of pardon, uh, an affirmation, righteous before God. He takes care of all of our sins, and we praise him for that. How are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having previously sinned against all of God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined towards all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction righteousness and holiness of Christ as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me all I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart very good thank you you may be seated yes uh, together we've been saying 119, uh, 9 through 16, so uh, those of you who are uh, memorizing that, join us now as we say this together too. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts 
and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. So today we don't neglect his word. We come together to, uh, to uh, go into his word and to worship and to praise him. Um, this morning as we come together uh, in prayer, um, I also have done uh, something that Pastor Todd has kind of encouraged us to do many times, uh, is pray psalms. And one of, my, one of uh, our favorite psalms, my favorite psalm, and I'm sure yours too, is 139. And so we're going to pray that psalm together. What I did was I did uh, change the pronouns from me and I to we and us so that it would include all of us here together. So let's pray together. O oh Lord, you have searched us and know us. You know when we sit and when we rise. You perceive our thoughts from afar. You discern our going out and our lying down. You are familiar with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem us in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon us. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us too lofty for us to attain. Where can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? If we go up to the heavens, you are there. If we make our bed in the depths, you are there. If we rise on the wings of the dawn, if we settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide us. Your right hand will hold us fast. If we say, surely the darkness will hide us, the light becomes night around us. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created our inmost being. You knit us together in our mother's womb. We praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. We know that full well. Our frame was not hidden from you when we were made in the secret place, when we were woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw our unformed body. All the days ordained for us were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to us are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were we to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When we awake, we are still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Away from us, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do we not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? We have nothing but hatred for them. We count them our enemies. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if, is there, see if there is any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. And Father God, this is our prayer, that you would lead us in the way everlasting. We thank you, Father, that you know us so well. You made us exactly in your image. And whatever happens to us, Father, you know what's going on in our bodies because we're made just like you. And we trust you, Lord. We know that when we hurt in, in mind and body that you uh, care for us, that you will bring the healing we need. And so we bring those to you who are hurting today. Lord, there are those who have lost loved ones those who are in the hospital dealing with illness at home, uh, those who are dealing with even the COVID uh, pro uh, virus, and we lift them up to you. Father, there are many who have experienced death because of it, and we, we pray that you'd be with those folks who mourn the loss of loved ones. 
Father God, we thank you that we can come together this morning to, uh, to worship you, and to hear your word. We thank you, Lord, for, for bringing us here, for the opportunity to come to you. We know, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus for us, and it's in him, his name that we come and offer our worship and praise, knowing that you suffered and died on Calvary's cross for us. Your blood was shed. It ran red so our sins could be washed. White as snow, you tell us in your word. So, Father, just accept our worship and praise. And be with uh, Pastor Rich as he leads us in the message this morning. And we'll give you praise for all that you are for us and all that you do. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, I can turn it over to Rich. can elbow bump, we can shake hands probably and get away with it, but uh, glad to be able to be with you all this morning, and um, yeah, pastors have a way of putting elders up here in spots like this just so things like that can happen, and then they can come back and tell you how smart and good they are, right? But uh, I don't think that was at the heart of what Todd was up, up to this morning, but uh, I appreciate Kurt's willingness to uh, to take one for the team and to step up and to do uh, the preliminary stuff. And I don't even like calling it the preliminary stuff because it is part of our worship. But uh, it's good to, uh, to be able to be with you this morning, to, uh, to be able to worship. And um, yeah, just uh, I'm going to give you a two-minute quick update on workplace chaplains just because Ron Brower asked me to. And if Ron asks you to do something, you know you might as well because otherwise he's going to keep bugging you until you do. So, um, but Ron uh, just said, how's things going with workplace? And uh, yeah, it's good to report that uh, things with workplace chaplains are going well. Um, we actually uh, have been able to, uh, to maintain our ministry kind of throughout this whole COVID period of time. Um, a number of the plants that we work in were deemed kind of essential industries. Uh, a number of those are food plants, and so as you know, uh, many of those folks have been uh, rolling on and uh, continuing to, uh, to do what they do. Um, and so, yeah, probably at, uh, at the low point of our opportunity for ministry, we were probably about 50% in the, er, in the, uh, the shops that we work with, and 50% of our chaplains were trying to do some ministry in other ways, and uh, that's caused us to get a little bit creative in uh, doing some videos and emails and different things like that that have allowed us to continue to reach out to people as they've been working from home and doing some different things. But uh, by now, we're about back up to uh, pretty much 100% of the, the places that we are able to be in, we're back in and, uh, and able to minister. So appreciate that uh, support and interest. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, chaplains now in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan, and so uh, we have uh, kind of stretched out a little bit in that regard. We've got uh, a couple facilities that we're working with that are part of uh, Johnsonville uh, Sausage Company, so Johnsonville Brats, um, nothing against evils out that way, but if you're buying brats and you don't like evils for whatever reason, uh, maybe Johnsonville is a good choice for you, but uh, anyway, um, we do have two of their facilities, one in Wisconsin and one down in Illinois and uh, about 40 miles south of Chicago. Uh, Kankakee area, and so uh, we're, we're glad to be able to be in there, and uh, those have been really, uh, really good opportunities to, uh, to minister and to, to be able to see um, God at work through some, uh, some good chaplains that he's brought our way to, uh, to be able to minister there. So we're thankful for that, thankful to Todd and uh, for the opportunity to be here as the elders called and uh, said, hey, can you come and preach? And, um, you know, so much going on right now, right? Um, for months, we've sat in our homes and we've watched uh, church on TV, um, and not in like the, the normal way, but we've watched Facebook, and you know, some of us that don't do technology have learned technology to try to stay connected and figure things out and be a part of that, and uh, again, I, I tire at times, but the reality is there that these are really unprecedented times that we're living in, um, and the question is, what does God say to us? in the middle of those kinds of times. What is it that God wants us to hear from him as we, uh, as we try to, uh, to live faithfully for him uh, during these days? And, um, and then the question for me, as I get a call from someone like Kurt saying, can you come out and preach at Lucas, is what does God want me to say, or what does God want to say to you through me? Um, you know, that's a question that we who at times stand in the pulpit 
have to ask ourselves, what is it that God wants to say to you through me? And uh, that's always a scary question because it's still, even after a long time of doing this, it still kind of freaks me out that God chooses to speak to his people through pastors at times, through all of us as children of God. We all can hear and access God's word, but, but it still sometimes scares me to think that God actually wants me to speak to you for him today. And um, so it's not something that I take lightly. It's not something that I just do uh, kind of off the cuff or unpreparedly. Um, but it's with a full sense of the seriousness of that kind of a task to actually speak a word for God uh, that we approach the text this morning. And, you know, it's true that every aspect of our life is being affected by the current conditions that we live in. And, you know, it seems like a long time ago, but it's not, that the main things on our minds and in our, in our country's mind were things that really were quite a bit of just political drama, we'll call it. Um, political chaos and drama, maybe. But we were talking about things like impeachment and Russia and all of that stuff. And it seemed to consume a lot of our minds and a lot of our attention. And it was like, wow, these are crazy things going on in our world and in our government and in our country. And people were picking up sides and kind of all of that stuff. And it seems so long ago because... Then we learned new words like coronavirus or the Rona or COVID or COVID-19 or pick your way to describe it. But this, this pandemic, which we also kind of learned as a word, I thought it was always an epidemic. But no, there's a pandemic too, evidently. And, and we learned all of these things. And, and now we're living through that. And out of that came economic chaos. And one day we were going to work and then the next day no you can't go to work and well now you can come to work but you can't come to work and you can work this way and all of these restrictions and rules and things that were kind of put upon us and then in the midst of that a bad cop decides to lean on a guy's neck with his knee and kills him and again the country goes crazy pent up feelings and pent up emotions and anger just comes pouring out of all kinds of places people with less than pure motives decide this is our time to take advantage of these conditions and they begin to riot and to loot and now we're facing potentially the dreaded second wave right and it's like oh the second wave it's, uh, it's just kind of a crazy crazy time and i'm not telling you anything new you understand all of that and maybe you, like me, have just kind of sat there at times thinking, what in the world has happened? Here in Lucas, Michigan, big questions, huge things that we don't usually have to even think about because our world is pretty small up here at times, and it can be small especially if we really want it to be because we can kind of get ourselves all hunkered down and live a pretty simple life. But it just seems like the events of our world right now have kind of forced all of us to kind of be in the middle of a whole lot of stuff. About a month ago, it was June 14th, it was a Sunday, and it was also Flag Day. And as I sat home on that particular Sunday thinking about it, um, and thinking about the, the significance maybe of those two things coming together, it being the Lord's Day, but it also being Flag Day and all of those other events that have been in the back of my mind, one of the things that I first thought about was the Pledge of Allegiance, right? One of our ways to start school, uh, when I was a kid at least, every morning. Uh, you stood at your desk, you put your hand over your heart, and you recited the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and that first line simply says, I pledge allegiance to the flag. And as I sat there a few weeks back thinking about that, it started to cause a whole lot of questions to, to go off in my mind, almost explode in my mind, if you will. Questions like, as a follower of King Jesus, where does my ultimate allegiance lie? What is my relationship to this flag and to this country, to its leaders? 
how do I live a distinctively Christian life in regards to this place of my birth? I don't know if you ever think about those kinds of things, but those are questions that have been rattling around inside my head. And interestingly, even as I've gone into different workplaces and talked with our chaplains, those are questions rattling around, it seems, in a lot of people's head. The definition of allegiance, a simple definition, is, is simply loyalty or commitment of a subordinate to a superior, or it's simply loyalty or commitment of an individual to a group or to a cause. That's what it means to have allegiance. And so what does that look like for God's people? That's a question I want to think with you about for just a few minutes this morning. What, is, what does that allegiance look like for God's people? I'd have you turn to Isaiah chapter 45. I just want to look at a couple of verses there this morning. Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. I think the Pew Bibles may still be NIV, and that's great. We'll, you'll, it won't be weird. It'll just be maybe a word or here that are different, but uh, we'll still figure it out together. Isaiah 45 Verses 22 and 23 say this, and Isaiah is speaking to the children of Israel, and he's speaking the words of God, and he says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return void. To me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear allegiance. From this text, as Christians, we begin with a, with a basic truth. This world belongs to God. And all of his desires, his plans, and his purposes will be accomplished. Let me just say that again. It's something that I know you've heard before. You maybe heard it in various ways. But it's a truth that we need to use as an anchor when everything else seems to be going crazy. This world belongs to God. And all of his desires, plans, and purposes will be accomplished. Nothing from this created realm will be able to thwart God's will. Now, if you guys were Baptists, I'd hear an amen. And I'm okay not hearing an amen, but I want you to know, in my heart, I'm hearing an amen because that is a rock-solid, foundational truth that when everything else is causing your mind to be in a stir and to wonder and to think what is going on it's important that we remember that nothing in this created realm is able to thwart the will of our father in heaven there is great strength in being able to anchor ourselves in the sovereignty of god during days of chaos and confusion. So what does all of this mean for us? It means this. It means that Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, even America itself as a nation, one day will bend the knee and say that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For some, it'll be a joyous proclamation that they'll make with every bit of excitement in their hearts. For others, it'll be spoken through gritted teeth. But the denial of that statement and that truth is not able to be held. It is true, it is foundational, it is basic, and it is something that you can anchor your life on. This is our Father's world. 
And so how do we live with this tension of, of allegiance and love to God and an allegiance and love for this nation? C.S. Lewis helped me to think about that because I've thought about that question. His, uh, his book, The Four Loves, um, had some thoughts about that, that at least as I've put it together. He says in there, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with that particular book of C.S. Lewis, it's worth picking up and reading, but he talks about four Greek words for love and what those words for love actually mean and how they work themselves out in society. He talks about the love of philos, which is friendship, right? And some of you are familiar with that word. You've heard it before in sermons, and people say things like preachers because they all know this one because we all learned it one day in seminary. But philos is the root word of Philadelphia, Philadelphia, philos, Delphia, Adelphia, brother, the city of brotherly love. Huh, that's kind of cool. That's what philos is. It's that, that friendship, that kind of love that results in, in friendship. There's also, Lewis says, a Greek word for love that's, that's the word eros. And eros is where we get the word erotic and erotica and all of those other words that regard sexual kind of love. He also talks about the Greek word agape, which is the love that God shows to us. Agape, and we're again familiar with that word. Then he talks about another word. And it's, it's a word called storge. It's kind of a weird word to pronounce, but it's storge. Which I think this morning may be the most interesting of those four loves in trying to get a handle on the question we have of how do we, how do, we do this, putting this love of God next to this love of country and all of these things and bring this together. Now, storge is a unique word. It's, it's, it's a kind of affection well, I brought, a, I brought a teaching tool with me. It's the kind of affection that you feel for an old pair of slippers that your wife really thinks you probably ought to throw away. And you kind of say, I'm not throwing those away. They finally fit just right. They fit like a glove. And you know, they may even have a little hole in the bottom of them, and they may be worn a little bit because you ran out on the driveway or you did a few things, and don't worry, I'll put sanitizer on my hands after touching them. But, but you know, it's, it's that old kind of slipper thing. That's what Storge kind of talks about. It's, it's a little bit like that kid who, who has a doll, and it's a doll just made out of rags. But they love that doll. And even if you brought them, you know, the, the latest of, uh, of the American Girl doll collection, they might take that and play with it for a little bit, but you know, after a while, they'd be kind of back with their little rag doll. That's kind of the thing that Storge is talking about. It's that affection that, that you just don't want to part with it because you have that kind of feeling about it. And you know... That's a little bit of a kind of, of patriotism that, that's probably very good and very admissible. At least Lewis kind of makes that case that it's something that's appropriate for a Christian to feel. I mean, you get the idea that, that there's kind of that, that feeling of, of an affection for a city or a fatherland or maybe even a language or a culture when you leave it and you get on a plane and you go to another country, you know, there's, there is an excitement and, and a challenge and a, a stimulation about going other places. But there's something inside that, that when you come home, it just kind of feels good. I remember my first trip abroad, um, down to the Dominican, actually, with my daughter Katie and her class. And I remember just really distinctively coming back into Miami and standing in line with our passports and stepping up when the officer looked at us and gave us the okay, stepping up to that line and him looking at us and looking at those passports and hitting them with a couple of stamps and handing them back and looking us in the eye and saying, welcome home. 
And you know, it was kind of weird. I had a little moment there. I had this like emotional kind of thing because it was like, wow, yeah, I'm home. This, I'm back in my country where I have some of those strong feelings, just like some of you do. And that's probably a good thing because there's something comforting about the food that we eat and, and sleeping in our own beds and being in our own houses and walking on our streets and hearing our language. All of that seems to be something that, that God puts his approval on. I think that maybe we could wrap this idea up with this idea. Whatever form your patriotism takes, I think we also, though, as God's children, need to understand that there ought to be a, a, a deep sense and a deep understanding that we're more closely bound sometimes to brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries and even other cultures and maybe other races than we are to our closest unbelieving family member or neighbor or person in our country. Let me just say that again. We ought to feel at times a closer tie and a closer connection to believers in other parts of the world than we feel to unbelievers here in our own neighborhoods and land. I think that's a very crucial thing for us to understand. Otherwise, I think our patriotism can drift over into almost a form of idolatry. It's interesting that Kurt's reading this morning for confession had to do with idolatry. Pastor Todd and I didn't, uh, didn't put that together ahead of time. I think God might have been just kind of tweaking us a little bit, even in that reading, to have our minds open to that idea. God is our king, not man. His kingdom is where we owe our final allegiance. And under that banner, I do think it's right to be thankful that God gave us our land freely. And I'm thinking now particularly of those of us who have been blessed to have been born in America. God gave us this opportunity freely. Not one of you chose to be born here. That was purely by God's choice, and I would even add by God's kindness we don't deserve this place any more than we deserve any other kind of common grace or special grace. It's great to be, and, and I even think it's right for us to be thankful that people paid a high price to preserve this land with its freedoms and its, its cultural distinctives. And it's right to be thankful that, that we have these cultural slippers to put on and we don't want to throw them away. But it's also important for us to remember that we're pilgrims. We're pilgrims. We're exiles. We're sojourners. We're refugees ourselves in a very refugee-heightened culture. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. And Philippians 3.20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. We are sojourners and pilgrims on the earth. And that's owing to the fact that this world is fallen, not because it's simply created. That's an important distinction. We're going to spend eternity in a created world. So we're not aliens simply because earth is a bad thing. That's not how God sees it. The thing that's bad here is that Satan is the god of this world, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4. And in the world that we will spend eternity in, Satan will no longer be present. And it'll be a created place made especially for us by our God and by our Father. And that's the problem. That's why sometimes we feel so alien here. It's that the God of this world is Satan, and he holds such extensive sway in the systems 
of this world. The world is permeated with sin. And it makes us feel like we are not at home. We're aching that we would be done with sin and be at home with Jesus in the presence of his holiness. His holiness is the air that a true Christian wants to breathe. Again, when I say that we're aliens and exiles and sojourners and pilgrims, I don't mean that the earth is a place that we ought to despise. I mean sometimes the structures that we find ourselves in are so permeated with sin that we long for something new. We long for something filled with the presence and holiness of God. So I have to come back in, in, in closing then to this alien and exile status as the main thing. We're citizens of heaven before we're earthly patriots. And that means that, that there are going to be conflicts between the way that Christ our King calls us to live and the ways that sometimes our homeland expects us to live. The other reminder is that the culture and, and ethos of, the, of this country is another reminder that we have to give. It's not static. The thing that, that's wonderful about America sometimes is that it's not the same. It's changing. It's changing many times for the good. But our country is always changing, and it's always been changing. Again, when we found the country, we founded it on eternal principles and truths, they said, in the founding documents. And within a few years, we found that those principles and rules weren't being lived out appropriately, and our nation went to war with itself to try to right some of those wrongs. And so our country is constantly changing. And, and yet, how do, we, how do we do earthly patriotism when what we regard as our own culture is in the process of transformation? For some of us, even now, it seems hard because it seems like the country that we long to be patriotic toward and be loyal to and swear that allegiance to isn't the same country that it was when we were kids or isn't the same country maybe that it was even 20 years ago. So in both of those conflicts, the ones that come at us from the outside and even the ones that come from inside, I think it's important for us to realize that God's role for us as his children is not to simply be cultural preservers. We're not here to simply maintain or to keep things like they were. That's not our job. Our main mentality and, and task isn't to be to preserve a particular culture think that's the kind of mindset that's produced crazy, terrible things in our world. That desire to preserve one particular group or one particular people or, or even one particular religion at times has led people to do terrible things in the name of that cause or that people or that religion. It's almost always resulted in the slaughter of people. So we have to be careful about not trying to, to exalt or to raise up any particular racial or ethnic or cultural patriotism or at-homeness, right? Our slipper. That thing that we feel so comfortable in that, no, we don't want to throw it away. But we can't hold on to that to the point that we begin to demonize and actually hurt other people. Our stance ought to be that we as Christians first, as those who serve King Jesus, those who swear ultimately our allegiance to him, we have to bring his kingdom values to bear on the challenges that we face as individuals and even as communities and ultimately as states and nations to see how we can bring 
the values of Christ's kingdom to bear on those situations, not just our earthly preferences, not just things the way they are because that's how we like them. For some of us and for me, that's hard. I'm one of those guys who kind of likes things the way I like things. And my wife decides she's going to do some spring cleaning and she moves the cupboards around and I open the cupboard and it's like, where's the pepper? This is where the pepper is. Well, not today. Well, come on, don't move things on me. It kills me. You know, anyway, that's a little window into our home. But, you know, it's that kind of stuff. It's not just about my earthly preferences. It's not just having things the way we like them. Ultimately, there's bigger principles in play here. And those are the principles of the kingdom of God. And so in other words, those, those earthly loves, those things that Lewis spoke of about friendship and sex and even affections for our country or our favorite slippers, they have to have their proper place in our superior allegiance, ultimately to God. Our love for God needs to be primary. Only the value of our king can bring a right ordering of the value of our earthly loves. Only our heavenly father, our heavenly patriotism, if you will, can order our earthly patriotism, and that ultimately orders our allegiance. First and ultimately, our allegiance is to God, and then to others. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, we, we do thank you for the opportunity to be present this morning and to worship, to hear your word, and we trust to hear a word from you today. We pray that you would help us to take these thoughts to heart, that you would cause us to be, to be challenged in our thinking about the areas and the things that we are willing to swear our allegiance to. Help us, Father, to be those who, who place our first and ultimate and highest allegiance to you. And as we do so, may you make us citizens of this country that represent you well and bring joy to your heart. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I ask you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, number 739 in your hymnal, verses 1 through 3 of I Surrender All.
that as your children, we owe you our ultimate allegiance. And may, not only knowing that fact, but living in its truth, may it make us the kind of citizens of this place that you long for us to be. Willing to speak hard truths, willing to, to love those who are unlovable, willing to be your hands and your feet and to extend your kingdom as we do so in the power of your Holy Spirit, as we ask this all for the glory of Jesus, our King. Amen.